While SpaceX breaks records with rapid Starship development, Blue Origin's New Glenn remains stuck after a decade of delays. But Elon Musk's recent insights reveal something deeper. This isn't just about rocket failures. It's about two fundamentally different philosophies that could determine who controls the future of space. What most people miss is the real reason behind New Glenn's struggles and why this matters far beyond just another delayed launch. We'll uncover exactly what Musk observed about Blue Origin's approach and how it exposes a critical flaw in traditional aerospace thinking. Let's dive right in. When you look at the numbers, New Glenn's development story reveals a stark engineering reality that most people completely miss. This rocket began development in 2015. That's a full decade of work for a vehicle that only achieved its first flight in January 2025. To put this in perspective, SpaceX developed the entire Falcon 9 from design to first flight in just over four years, and even ULA's Vulcan rocket, which uses the exact same BE-4 engines as New Glenn, has already completed three successful flights. But here's what few people realize about the technical challenges Blue Origin faced. Unlike most rocket companies that build expendable vehicles first and add reusability later, Blue Origin jumped directly from their small suborbital New Shepard to a massive orbital class booster with full reusability built in from day one. Think of it like trying to design a Formula One race car that can also transform into a perfectly functioning helicopter. The engineering complexity multiplies exponentially. The BE-4 engines themselves tell this story perfectly. Each of New Glenn's seven first-stage engines generates around 550,000 pounds of thrust at liftoff, but these powerhouses faced years of combustion instability issues that delayed their qualification. Getting all seven engines fitted, tested, and ready for flight requires completing a static fire test, where the engines fire on the pad while the rocket is held down. Imagine testing seven jet engines simultaneously while making sure none of them destroy the others. And here's a detail most people overlook. Blue Origin's approach to testing follows their motto, Gratitim Ferociter, meaning step-by-step, -step, ferociously. This summer, they successfully completed critical module activation tests for the rocket's hydrogen peroxide-powered systems, including reaction control thrusters and hydraulic systems for the aft section. These systems are like the rocket's nervous system, controlling complex operations during flight, but they represent just one piece of an intricate puzzle. The current timeline for their September 29th mission reveals just how tight their schedule really is. They still need to complete vehicle stacking, roll out to launch Complex 36 in Florida, conduct a wet dress rehearsal that's fully fueling the rocket without ignition, attach NASA's escapade payload, and secure their FAA launch license. We'll come back to this point later. But this compressed timeline is creating pressure that could determine Blue Origin's entire future trajectory. But this is just the beginning. What's really surprising is how this technical approach reveals a fundamental philosophical divide that's reshaping the entire space industry. This leads to a remarkable discovery about how the modern space industry actually works. While Blue Origin follows traditional aerospace methodology, extensive ground testing, careful validation, and deliberate progress, SpaceX has pioneered something completely different. Rapid iterative testing with multiple prototypes to quickly learn and adapt from real-world failures. And here's what's truly noteworthy about this contrast. SpaceX's Ship 37 recently completed extensive ground testing, including checks of its redesigned hot stage ring and reinforced grid fins, modifications intended to improve booster stability and reduce stress during stage separation. But here's the key difference. SpaceX can test, fail, improve, and test again within months, while Blue Origin faces intense pressure to succeed on their very first orbital mission attempt. The competitive landscape tells an even more compelling story. As we'll see in the next section, SpaceX continues advancing their Mechazilla launch tower, that massive structure designed to catch the super heavy booster during descent. Engineers are refining the chopstick arms and testing updated software controls for precise timing and positioning, aiming for a full booster catch before year's end. Meanwhile, Blue Origin must achieve their first New Glenn launch and booster recovery largely on schedule, 
following their much more deliberate approach. But there's a detail most people overlook about the economic implications. Blue Origin struggled to meet their public goal of flying eight times in 2024, something already out of reach, contrasts sharply with SpaceX's ability to maintain regular launch cadences while simultaneously developing next-generation vehicles. This isn't just about bragging rights. It's about proving commercial viability to customers and investors. Why would SpaceX accept this risk of rapid iteration over careful testing? The answer lies in market dynamics. First, faster development means capturing market share sooner. Second, real-world data from actual flights often reveals problems that ground testing simply cannot predict. And most importantly, this approach allows SpaceX to offer increasingly competitive pricing while reinvesting profits into even more ambitious projects. The timeline significance becomes clear when you consider future missions. Blue Origin plans to send their first Blue Moon lander, Mark 1, on a demonstration mission next summer. This 8-meter-tall lander is designed to deliver about 3 metric tons of cargo to the lunar surface, testing critical systems including the BE-7 engine, cryogenic systems, and precision landing capabilities within 100 meters of a target. And here's why this changes everything. And this is where things get interesting, because Blue Origin's next few months could fundamentally alter the trajectory of commercial spaceflight. If they successfully launch and recover New Glenn's first stage on September 29th, they'll finally demonstrate reusability that makes them competitive with SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. But what happens if they fail again or face another delay? The realistic prediction based on available data suggests Blue Origin faces a critical inflection point. Their acquisition of Honeybee Robotics, which develops systems like PlanetVac for soil collection and Lister for measuring lunar subsurface heat, shows they're building comprehensive lunar capabilities beyond just transportation. This positions them uniquely for NASA's Artemis program, where their single launch approach for lunar missions offers advantages over SpaceX's more complex multi-launch orbital refueling requirements for Starship HLS. But here's what few people realize about the long-term implications. Blue Origin's careful, methodical approach might actually prove superior for certain mission types, especially those requiring extreme reliability over rapid iteration. Think of deep space missions to Mars or complex lunar surface operations, where you can't afford to fail fast and learn. You need to succeed on the first attempt. The potential challenges ahead are significant, but not insurmountable. Blue Origin must prove they can maintain regular launch schedules while keeping costs competitive. They need to demonstrate that their decade of careful development translates into superior reliability and performance. Most critically, they must show that their approach can adapt quickly enough to compete in an industry increasingly dominated by rapid innovation cycles. What's truly remarkable is how this competition is quietly determining who controls the space economy of the next decade? SpaceX's rapid iteration has given them early market dominance, but Blue Origin's methodical approach could prove more sustainable for complex high-stakes missions. The contrast between SpaceX's move-fast-and-break-things mentality and Blue Origin's step-by-step -step ferociously philosophy isn't just about corporate culture. It's about two fundamentally different visions for how humanity expands into space. The September 29th mission isn't just another launch date on the calendar. It's the moment when Blue Origin either proves their decade of patient engineering was worth the wait or confirms that the future of spaceflight belongs to those willing to fail fast and iterate faster. The outcome will echo through every future space venture, from lunar bases to Mars colonies, determining not just who gets there first, but who builds the infrastructure that makes staying possible. This is exactly why Elon Musk's observations about New Glenn cut so deep. We're witnessing the moment when two fundamentally different approaches to space development reach their ultimate test. What this means is that September 29th isn't just about Blue Origin proving their rocket works. It's about proving whether methodical, traditional aerospace thinking can survive in an era of rapid iteration and acceptable failure. The bigger picture here connects directly to humanity's space future. SpaceX's approach has already revolutionized access to low Earth orbit, but Blue Origin's careful methodology could prove essential for the permanent infrastructure we'll need on the Moon and Mars. 
places where you can't afford to fail fast when human lives depend on every system working perfectly the first time. And this is just the beginning. Over the next six months, we'll see Blue Origin's lunar lander demonstration, SpaceX's first booster catch attempts, and potentially the definitive answer to which development philosophy will dominate the next decade of space exploration. The winner doesn't just capture market share, they set the template for how humanity expands beyond Earth. How do you think this philosophical divide will shape our journey to becoming a spacefaring civilization? Will careful engineering triumph over rapid iteration? Or will speed continue beating perfection in the space race? This is Space Corps, and we dive deep into the developments that are quietly reshaping our cosmic future. If you want more analysis that connects the technical details to the bigger picture, you know what to do. Because the next chapter of human spaceflight is being written right now, one launch at a time. China's Tiangong station just achieved what seemed impossible, cutting fuel consumption by 90% while the ISS burns through 800 kilograms annually just to stay in orbit. This electric propulsion breakthrough isn't just impressive engineering, it's reshaping the entire future of space stations. But here's what's really remarkable. We'll reveal how this Hall Effect thruster technology works and why the aging ISS simply can't compete. Let's dive right in. When most people think about keeping a space station in orbit, they imagine rocket engines firing briefly to nudge it back into position. But China's Tiangong station has fundamentally changed this equation with a technology that sounds like science fiction. Electric propulsion that uses charged particles moving at 30 times the speed of sound. Here's the technical breakdown that's got NASA taking notes. The Tianhe core module houses four Hall effect thrusters, each operating between 0.5 to 10 kilowatts and producing 80 millinewtons of thrust. To put this in perspective, that's roughly the force of holding a piece of paper in your hand. But in the vacuum of space, this gentle push becomes incredibly powerful over time. The engineering elegance lies in the physics. These thrusters ionize xenon gas and accelerate the charged particles using electric fields, creating that characteristic blue glow you might have seen in photos. The particles exit at velocities exceeding 30 times the speed of sound, far faster than any chemical propulsion system could achieve. And here's what few people realize. This isn't just about efficiency. It's about fundamentally changing how we think about orbital maintenance. Traditional chemical thrusters on the ISS face a brutal reality. Without constant fuel resupply, the station would plummet back to Earth. The ISS burns through approximately 800 kilograms of chemical fuel annually just to maintain its orbit. Tangong's electric system reduces this to a fraction, saving up to 800 kilograms per year in chemical fuel consumption while dramatically extending operational capability. The Chinese Academy of Sciences solved two major historical problems with electric propulsion. First, the low thrust issue, by clustering four medium power thrusters and operating them continuously rather than in short bursts. Second, the erosion problem that typically destroys ion engines over time. They developed magnetic shielding that repels damaging particles away from engine walls and created ceramic materials that withstand extreme heat and radiation for extended periods. But here's the data that really matters. Without electric propulsion, Tiangong's altitude would drop 30 kilometers in just 100 days. With the system active, that decay rate plummets to only 7 kilometers over the same period. We'll come back to this point later because the implications extend far beyond just one space station. The system's design for maintainability represents another breakthrough. The gas storage modules can be replaced in orbit using robotic arms, something that's never been attempted before on this scale. This makes Tiangong the first space station in history designed for long-term electric propulsion maintenance in orbit. But this is just the beginning. What's really surprising is how this technology positions China to dominate the next phase of space infrastructure development. This achievement represents more than an engineering upgrade. It signals a fundamental shift in how spacefaring nations approach orbital infrastructure. While the ISS represents the collaborative approach of the 1990s, Tiangong embodies 21st century efficiency thinking applied to space engineering. 
The competitive landscape reveals stark contrasts. The ISS, now 26 years old, carries over 100 tons of what has essentially become dead weight in its massive truss structure. Originally designed to solve the Soviet-era Mir station's power problems, this truss-based architecture made sense when solar panel efficiency hovered around 15%. But modern technology has made this approach obsolete. Here's where the numbers tell the story. The ISS generates about 120 kilowatts after recent upgrades, requiring enormous solar arrays that now overlap and block sunlight from reaching each other. Tiangong achieves nearly the same power output, 100 kilowatts, with only half the solar panel area, and that's operating at just 50% of its design capacity. The economic implications ripple through the entire space industry. Traditional space station maintenance requires constant resupply missions, carrying fuel, spare parts, and consumables. Every kilogram launched to orbit costs thousands of dollars, making fuel-hungry stations like the ISS increasingly expensive to operate. Tiangong's electric propulsion system directly addresses this cost spiral. And here's what most overlook about the timing. NASA has already announced plans to retire the ISS later this decade, partly due to these escalating operational costs. Meanwhile, China's station is designed from the ground up for decades of operation with minimal resupply requirements. The standardization advantage compounds these benefits. The ISS uses at least five different docking systems, SSVP, CBM, APAS-95, and others, reflecting its piecemeal construction by multiple nations over decades. Tiangong uses a single standardized interface called GNCI for all connections. This isn't just elegant engineering, it's strategic thinking about scalability and future expansion. But there's a detail most people overlook in this comparison. Tiangong can function as a refueling hub for other spacecraft. When a cargo ship docks at one end and another spacecraft at the other,